Hey everyone. This episode we're talking about alignment from an organizational perspective. Last episode we had a bit of a chat, we started to open that conversation about as an individual aligning yourself from the inside out, what it looks like to do that in terms of getting organized so that you can show up and respond and have choice in how you respond to your external environment, why that's important as a leader. This episode, in keeping with the theme for January, which is alignment, I wanted to talk about alignment for organizations and alignment outside in. So this is a concept that I've shared before, aligning from understanding your customer, understanding their challenges, the opportunities, uh, what's important to them, and then lining your organization up so that everything that you do is working towards delivering what matters for your customers. Now, this is a concept that I am eternally, eternally grateful uh, to the Vanguard Method team for teaching me. They disrupted me in the best possible way um, a number of years ago now, and it's a concept that I continue to teach to my clients as well, this idea of taking from the outside and working out how to line up our organization internally as a result. All too often we spend a lot of time, what I would call navel-gazing, focusing on those things that are important to us as a business, like profit, um, you know, stakeholder engagement. Uh, and often there's a big gap in terms of what that means for our customers. What I want to do is to start to take you through that process of taking from the outside the customer, the end user, the person that uses our product or service, understanding the challenges and the opportunities that they have, and then lining our organization up to that not to all of those things that we count as important internally. We want to be working for our customers, not working for ourselves. There's a huge, huge benefit to taking this approach, right? There is uh, a, a huge benefit in terms of understanding what continuous learning and improvement looks like because you're constantly evolving towards what your customers need. Uh, there's a huge impact in terms of understanding waste and efficiency and waste reduction in your organization. And added bonus, you start to build towards a vision for something that's greater than ourselves, greater than our own organization, because you have this guiding light, right? So this alignment outside in, super, super useful, super important uh, in terms of how we build a responsive organization and where we want to get to. So again, caveat, there is no silver bullet. There's no perfect path. We're not going to do this overnight. This is a constantly evolving process, but it's something that we can check ourselves against. Are we continuing to walk towards this outcome or are we walking away from that alignment with customers? So part of the reason why this is so important, right? If we think about customer expectations in our own industry and in our own organization in terms of the products or services that we offer, it's really easy to see why underperforming in the eyes of our customers would be more expensive. We have this, uh, if, if we don't meet customer expectations, we have our higher support costs. We have more inquiries from customers trying to get information or understand or figure out how to use or operate um, or even purchase our products or services. Um, we will have a higher cost of servicing complaints. Um, there's a whole bunch of things, there's a whole bunch more work that we have to do when we underperform. It's quite an easy concept to see, right? So we've got that first piece of understanding that what's good for our customer is also going to be good for our business. We'll take it one step further. If we are over delivering for our customer, there's a cost involved with that too. I've worked within organizations who were giving out movie tickets as a way to try and lift NPS scores within the organization um, because realistically, they were struggling to understand what was important to their customers and how to do that effectively. And so throwing in movie tickets on top was this way of lifting a performance measure that the executive had deemed to be important. So not only were they throwing money at trying to over deliver, they were also dealing with all these extra support costs as well, right? So just total nightmare. The reality is that what's good for our customer is good for our business. Because when we deliver to those expectations, we're not underperforming in the eyes of the customer. So we reduce those support costs. We reduce those complaint costs. We reduce all of that wasted effort that goes into over explaining, 
um, and trying to work through making good on a promise that our customer had perspective on, the reality is they're going to ask for us to come back to their expectation whether or not that was our intention. So they, we, we avoid all of that cost and investment and extra effort when we deliver to expectations. And by not over-delivering, and we can make a choice about how much we over-deliver, absolutely, but by not over-delivering, we're also not adding cost in terms of over-servicing customer and giving them a whole bunch of stuff that they don't really need or want, and potentially just creating more noise as well. So we want to get it just right. It's kind of like Goldilocks in the porridge, right? Not too little, not too much, just right. That's where we want to go. So one of the ways that we can do this is using a method of customer observation to start to drive the insights in our business and to drive the types of change and improvement that we're looking for. And this is a super, super simple exercise that you can do. Once I learned it, I incorporated it into an ongoing part of my role as a leader, as an executive within organizations. I spend a large percentage of my time going and understanding organizations using this tool on a regular basis. It's not a once-off, it's a it's an ongoing regular practice. And I've started to I, I started to grow the amount of time that I spend doing this type of work because I've just found it so valuable in terms of understanding how and where we want to and need to align as an organization. But it goes something like this. Grab your journal, wander down to the front line. Go to somewhere where your organization interacts with the customer. Go, go for the haptic. Go for the, the, the point that you start to have those interactions. Now, this could be a reception desk. It could be a call center. Call centers are great for this. You can get a whole bunch of interactions really, really quickly. Anywhere that you are interacting with customers directly, that your teams on the front line uh, are talking to and interacting with customers. Set up a safe environment. So make sure that you have had a conversation with your team that you are not there to evaluate their performance. You are simply there to observe what it is that customers are asking for, what's important to them, and you are there to listen to anything that might stop your team from being able to deliver that. Make sure you set up that safe space. It's really critical. I don't like having somebody sitting behind me making a whole bunch of notes watching me work. That's super awkward. Make sure you make it safe. Just get rid of all of that awkwardness for your team. And then spend some time. Spend some time watching, writing down verbatim what customers are asking for in their words. So not that they came in with a billing inquiry. I want you to write down what the customer said in their own words. Hey, I'm calling because I think my bill's wrong. I don't understand it. Can you help me talk it through? It's really, really critical that we get those verbatims because we only get one shot at that. We don't get to go back and reinterpret at a later date. Take those verbatims. And what you'll find is that as you go through this process more and more, it becomes more and more obvious that getting those verbatims from customers, this whole level of richness of detail and data that you can pull out of at a later date. So take the time, listen to what customers are saying, write it down, and then keep a, keep a track record of where that conversation ends up in relation to what they asked first. Did we actually deliver what mattered for the customer at the end of their interaction? Or did we push back on them and say, no, we can't help you with that? Did we maybe say, yes, we can help you with that, but it's going to take some time, there's some other work to do, and we, we put them into some kind of business process flow to try and work out how to get to what they need. Spend the time to understand what your customers are asking for and how well we're doing that, because that gives you an indication of what's important in terms of the expectations of your customers and how well you're performing in their eyes. And we can start to see where we sit on that curve. Are we underperforming in their eyes? Are we over delivering? Are we just right? And that'll start to give you this guide around where are, where are we from a customer's perspective? Invaluable information, right? This is the core of what NPS and all those other measures are trying to get to. And actually, it's a super, super, super simple conversation. It's a super simple exercise to go out there and collect that data yourself. 
And I really, really stress and emphasize the importance of doing this for yourself so that you can hear it with your own ears. As you start to progress, absolutely you want to incorporate your entire team doing this type of work. But honestly, it's invaluable to get out there and listen to it for yourself. So you'll learn things about your organization that you never knew existed. Uh, and the pro tip, whilst you're there, ask your team, what are the things that stop you from delivering that thing that mattered to the customers? And you're going to learn a whole bunch more about the systemic constraints in your organization, the way that you're organized and structured that's actually blocking your team from delivering to a customer's expectations. So that's, that's the concept. And what I wanted to do as well was just to add in a little bit more oomph. So some of you will have heard me talk about this book, Firms of Endearment. Great, super cool book, right? Uh, so Firms of Endearment is all about how we can take this people-obsessed approach, customer-obsessed, uh, employee-obsessed, people-obsessed approach, and what it looks like when we do that. And I wanted to stress the importance of working in this way. And I think the numbers within this book, for me, the numbers in this book really make the difference. This is uh, my, my go-to text when I'm working with boards to say, not only are these ways of working important, but actually when you implement this mindset, when you implement these methodologies, you're going to get better outcomes for your stakeholders. And so all of a sudden, if you don't go down this path, you are now negligent in your duty of care to your stakeholders and your shareholders because there is a better way and you're choosing not to take it. So some of the data, a bit of a sneak preview for those of you that don't have the book. Some of the data, I'm on page 20 of Firms of Endearment, table 1.3, financial performance. Um, what this amazing group of authors did was they took a group of companies that they term firms of endearment, and they studied them for a period of time. They studied them by uh, traditional measures of revenue, growth, all of those things that we associate with balance sheets and the way we understand business today. And they followed what was going on within the organizations and they tracked data around these metrics, and then they compared it. And specifically, they compare it to uh, the Standard & Poor's 500, and they compare it to the Jim Collins Good to Great companies. So if you haven't come across that book, Good to Great is, I guess, believed to be the epitome of corporate performance. This is about, these are the companies that we should uphold and, and put on a pedestal as inspiration for how well we can perform. And so in this book, they take the set of companies that they call firms of endearment and they compare them to the performance of good to great companies. And we're talking about growth here, financial performance and growth over um, a number of years. And you would expect that when you take this customer obsessed approach, when you take this approach around obsessing over your employees, and one of the stories is about a particular company that sent their deli counter staff all the way to France to do uh, cheese tasting and wine tastings and to educate them, then bring them back, put them behind the counter, serving customers. Um, you know, so we're talking about that level of investment in your team and your people in terms of being able to deliver what's important to customers, right? And you would think that that level of investment is well over and above and that you're potentially going to take a hit in terms of the growth and the um, revenues that you get as a result of doing all that investment in your staff. Well, here's the numbers. So, cumulative performance uh, in a three-year window for good to great companies, we're looking at a number of 221%. Um, and the firms of endearment are looking at roughly 83% over the three years. So we can see that there's a bit of a gap there, right? They've got data for five years, for 10 years, and for 15 years for these firms of endearment. And when we get right out to 15 years, we're looking at growth in good to great companies of 263%. Firms of endearment performing at 1,680%. 
So all of a sudden the tables are turned and there's this order of magnitude difference between uh, those firms that are in the good to great category and those firms of endearment that are taking this people obsessed approach. So if you are looking for some numbers and some data to validate your thinkings and feelings about these work methods and the, the thinkings and feelings that you have about taking a customer obsessed approach, then I would highly, highly recommend this book. It's an awesome, awesome resource. Um, I think that's all I wanted to share today. Let's just have a bit of a rant at you um, to share that tool around customer observation. I have shared it before. I will continue to share it again. It's, the, it's one of the first things that I do in any organization that I walk into is to get out there on the front line and start to understand what's important to customers. Because when we do, we get these kind of results. So that's it from me for this episode. I hope wherever you are in the world, you're having an awesome, awesome day. Quick reminder that if you would like the worksheets and the materials that accompany these videos and you want to go into this in a bit more detail, then hit me up with a message. We'll get you on the mailing list. You can join through the website as well uh, and you will start to get a bit more material to support some of the videos that are coming through over the coming months. So yeah, I hope wherever you are in the world today, you're having an awesome, awesome day. Take care and I will see you again very, very soon.